everyone. So this talk is going to be about aspect-oriented programming and useful decorators when working within the Jupyter Notebook. So let's start with a small intro or refresher about what are decorators. So this will be our agenda for today. Basically, what is aspect-oriented programming? How do we use it in decorators in Python? And then we'll rush through five cool applications. Hopefully, at least one of them will be use useful for you. Okay, so aspect-oriented programming is a catch-all phrase for cross-cutting concerns. Cross-cutting concerns is basically things that we care about that cannot be encapsulated in one model. For example, logging. We have logging all over our project. Logging, authorization, timing, those are things that we use a lot in a lot of different applications. Aspect and programming is very useful in a lot of other languages. It is usually called attributes or annotations, depend, depending on whether you come from Java, C Sharp, or any other languages. And it's also found on very popular frameworks such as Flask. If you ever wondered what is the at sign with app.route, that's a decorator. By the way, that's a fully functional code snippet that actually is a web server that always sends hello, no matter, no matter what you send it. Okay, so decorators in Python is the way that Python does aspects or aspect-oriented. Uh, it's also known as aspect. Now, Aspect in the programming does a little bit more. If you're familiar with Aspect J or any other frameworks, there are a lot of more complicated things. But we'll focus on basically, on basically on decorators and their use. So what is a decorator? Uh, if you listen through the today's keynote, then Mr. Beasley actually showed how to write a decorator. And I think it's very confusing to define a decorator. It's a function that gets another function and returns a third function. It could be kind of obfuscated. So let's start with an example. This is kind of, an, of a classic example of how to do logging with a decorator. So on the left-hand side, you can see how we use a decorator. We have the add sign and the log print. And then we define our logic, our very complicated uh, function that adds one to whatever number we get. And on the right-hand side, you can see the code. So what the decorator does, it defines another function denoted in green. And it returns that new function to be used as if it was the original function. So anytime I'm going to call the plus one function, I'm actually calling the green function. And the green function calls the original function and prints its result. So when I call the plus one function, both of them have been activated, which is very useful. Also, the value is returned, and also it's being printed to the screen. Another way to define decorators is using the call magic method. It's basically the same logic, but in class, in class form. Okay, that was our, basically, intro to decorators. And now for the fun part. Okay, so can, ev can everyone see the screen? And now? Okay. So our first use is memoization. Memoization is caching in memory. And we are going to use the LRU cache function that is found within the Python standard library. So let's start with defining the Fibonacci sequence uh, recursion. So very simple, nothing new in the definition. And we we'll try to call it twice. Once without the memory caching, the memorization, and once with. Uh, as we can see, can actually execute it, but 
we have shown that I don't want to spend time on it. When we execute the Fibonacci function on the number 30, which is not that large, we can see that it took, on average, I'm using the time it magic function, function by the way, if someone is not familiar with, it takes on average more than 400 times more than when I used it with the LRU cache. Now, the LRU cache, LRU stands for less recently used. It can be used for caching results in web servers and any other real-time applications. It gets a single parameter that says what is the size of the caching. If I don't specify the size, then it's unlimited, or at least until Python says otherwise. So in this toy example, I have an unlimited cache, and I get significant performance gains. Now, as you can see, Fibonacci is kind of a toy example. Let's try and use some, some, real, some real thing. So, does anyone familiar with the Levenstein distance? Great, so we see a lot of hands being raised. It's a very common metric in uh, natural language processing. Basically, Levenstein distance is the number of characters that you need to insert or delete between two words. So let's say that I have the word reshape, and I want to know what is the Levenstein distance for the word shapes. I am deleting the R and E at the beginning and appending an S at the end. So the Levenstein distance is three. Now, this is how you calculate the Levenstein distance. You get two parameters, the first word and the second word. Uh, it's, a it's a recursive function. And I took 10 random words from the dictionary that you can find on any Linux system. Uh, this is the path for a Mac, for the Mac OS. It's, I think it's similar or the same path or on other Linux distributions, but it's the standard uh, vo uh, vocabulary. Those are the 10 words that I got in random. If we want again, we will have other words. And I defined again the function twice, once with the LRU cache and once without. No difference aside from that. I ran it on all the possible combination of those 10 words, so 100 runs in total. And look at the time differences. It's like 10, 10 orders of magnitude. A 10 milliseconds against almost 40,000. Now, this function is more complicated than the Fibonacci function that could be easily optimized. So just with like typing those 10 characters, I get an, 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 an impressive performance increase. Okay, so caching in memory is fun, but it's not very practical for any real real life uses so the next stage is caching onto disk when storing the data on a json file so this is my first version of writing a json decorator basically what it does it checks whether the file exists you can see here if it does it loads it from the disk if it doesn't then it calls the function and saves it to the disk very simple very simple decorator. As you can see, my first run takes two seconds, and the second one is immediate. And we can see somewhere here. You can trust me that the file is being saved. So that's nice, but what I really want to do is I want to, to use the parameter. Most functions have more, uh, have an argument. They're not just independent calculations. So what I really want to do is to have something like this. So Fibonacci would save his uh, intermediate results within a file called fib underscore number, called some kind of number. And I would like to call this function recursively. So how do I do this? So Let's take a moment to talk about the inspect, the inspect model. Actually, 
those who were present in this morning lectures already know this, um, already heard of this model. So in Python, there are a lot of ways, basically three ways to define a function. It could be either with named arguments, for example, this function, this sum named th uh, three, sum named, sum three named, or we can use positional arguments. And the third way is to use key value arguments. All of those three functions do, do the same. They sum three numbers and the third argument is optional and if it's not specified, we, it's assumed to be three. But when I'm decorating a function, I don't really care how does its parameters being used. I want my decorator to work whether if it's named parameters, position parameters, I don't really care, I just want to pass it on. That's where the inspect model comes to, to our help. Using the inspect model, model, we can extract a function's signature and bind other arguments. And the arguments are going to be bound regardless of how they're being presented. So, for example, I bound those, the, the parameters one, two, and three for the sum three named, and I get an order dict, A equals to one, B equals to two, and C equals to three. That way, I can feed the input of that function to another function. And I'm feeding the input of the sum three named into the sum three key value. And as you can see, it works. That insight is very helpful when we design our decorator. Now, we can use the arguments as they are and fit it to the format function. Okay, so now if we have the notation that we saw above of fib underscore curly braces n, the built-in Python function is going to replace it for us. And it's, going to, it's, and it's going to be saved in different files. Okay, while we're talking about the inspect model, another very useful function that it has is the get source. Since Python is an in interpreted languages, given a function, I can extract its source code. Now, you might ask, why would I want to do it? Which brings which bring us back to, I think, the third and most useful uh, decorator in this lecture, the SSH decorator. Uh, I'm not going to go over the entire code of the SSH decorator, but let's start with its use. Giving a user password and a server name, I connect to my server. This is basically a wrapper for the well-known Paramico uh, package, if any, any of you are familiar with. And I implemented two functions. One is called the local call, which returns the current working deal on my machine. And an equivalent one, same code just with this decorator, that returns the current working deal on the remote server. Now, as you can see, the local call returns the current working deal on this, ma on this uh, MacBook, and the remote call returns the working directory on the remote server. Now, this is very useful, especially if you're like me working on a lot of servers, and you want to do it a lot and automate and copy, pr and copy data from server to server. Very convenient, very readable, and I really recommend using it. Another kind, kind of a syntactic sugar, uh, if you want to run bash commands on the remote uh, server, you can just use this right shift operator, which makes it look like a terminal, and it works. Uh, the code for, for this model and all of the other snippets that you see is available on my GitHub that you'll see at the end of, the, of this uh, lecture. Uh, another very useful application is for regression testing. Let's say that I have my Fibonacci function for before, and I was able to optimize it using this equation that I copied from, Wiki from Wikipedia. Now, 
I want to make sure that every time the f that the functions don't differ on the output. A very simple way to do it is to decorate the original function using a record decorator. Every time the function is being called, the arguments and the return value is being stored somewhere for purposes of this lecture in memory. And then I can just hit the replay and see where, where my functions differ. So, for example, I ran the Fibonacci sequence on numbers 0 to, to 3. These are the, the tests, values 0, 1 to 3. These are the expected values. And this is the closed form formula. And when I try to replay, you can see that my functions differ on the initial, the initial uh, term on n equals 0. OK, and last but not least, how to do interactive graphs within Jupyter. So not, not a, lot of, a lot of people are familiar with, but IPython, or Jupyter Notebooks, come with a lot of, um, a lot of cool things within the IPy widget uh, package. What I personally, li personally like most is the interact decorator. I can write any function that I want, for example, the square root, decorate it with the interact decorator and the range of numbers that I want to use. And there you go, it's being calculated in real time. If I were to add another parameter, which is, for example, a Boolean, I have to initiate it. then I'm going to have a checkbox that's also interactive. Very easy and very useful. Another useful application is plotting interactive graphs. Uh, what this code does is basically uses a, a Gaussian, plots a Gaussian, and I can play with its standard deviation. The only thing that you need to know in order for it to work properly is to add a flash figures call at the end. That's, a, that's the magic trick here. Once you do this, you can impress your colleagues with an interactive graph. Mm -hmm. I found it very useful, especially for clustering algorithms, which I don't know the number of clusters, and I can plot all, all, possible, uh, all possible options and see, and see it in real time. So, that was it. I hope that at least one of these five decorators would be useful for you. Uh, the code is available at my GitHub account. You can see it, you can copy it from here or from the PyCon uh, official website. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? For the SSH decorator? Yeah. Sure. So, first I connect to a server using the SSH connect function. I, I didn't want you to see my username and password, so it's a... And if, once I, I connected, I can just use this server name as a decorator in my code. Thank you.